welcome to our first presentation of this semester's Silicon Valley Leader Symposium. <laughs> Very good. For those of you who don't know me, that's probably everybody, uh, I am the interim dean of this college. So yes, I'm your dean. Uh, I just started this position two weeks ago, I mean two months ago. And today, it's not about the dean. We have a very special guest, guest to give you uh, some advice, uh, ideas, suggestions. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of this semester's uh, symposium, Mr. Joe Pinto. And Mr. Joe Pinto is a Senior Vice President, Cisco Te Technical Services. Uh, Joe has a BA in Business from Golden Gate University. Uh, since joining Cisco in 1991, Joe has directed programs that improve the customer experience through product and service quality. He and his team has created and implemented Cisco Smart Services, enabling the company and its partner to help Customer predictably manage the health and stability of their networks, reduce costs, mitigate risk, and prompt innovation. Under Joe's leadership, Cisco Service has received many industry honors. For example, JD Power and Associates Certified Technology, uh, technology Services and Support Certifications nine times, and Technology Services Industry Associate Star Award 26 times. So, many, many times, many awards. In 2014, Joe received the Charles W. Davidson College of Engineering. That's us. Dean Service Award for his exceptional support to our college's program and missions. Once again, please help me welcome Mr. Joe Pinto. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk for about 30 minutes. I'm gonna do some questions. But this is about, not only about Cisco, it's about you and your career. And the reason, and by the way, the person who's in charge of in your career is you. You know, when I first started at Silicon Valley, I was very fortunate that Cisco was my third startup. But I didn't know anybody at Cisco, and I tell, I'll tell you what I did. Now remember, this is before there was the internet. So I know you're thinking, you're going back to the days of the wagon train, okay? I had sent eight letters with my resume to eight different executives at Cisco, the head of HR, the vice president of engineering. I put private and confidential in each envelope. That's how I got the interview at Cisco. I actually used the mail and put private and confidential in the envelope to get the executives to open up my resume. So that began my journey. Okay, let me go through the few slides that I have, right? Who am I? I'm gonna give you a little bit about my history. I'm a person that was sitting there just like you. You know, from the day I started school, I started on a scholarship for engineering at Polytech in Brooklyn. I finished school 17 years later, 17 years later at night, right? Just think about that journey, 17 years later. Holy cow. Okay. It's not a person. It's okay. That was a test to see if we were awake. All right. A bit of an overview about who's the, who are these guys called Cisco? What exactly do they do? Right? And about networking, how to connect with people, and again, taking charge of your life and of your career. So a little story about myself. So I, uh, I grew up in uh, Red Hook, Brooklyn. That is a waterfront community. My parents were Italian. My father was a longshoreman. In those days, that was very physical work. They unloaded the ships, and it was 12, 13 hours of literally 50 to 75 pound boxes that had to be taken off a ship one at a time. Uh, my neighborhood was mostly African-American and Latino, so I was referred to as the white guy, um, which is an interesting experience, uh, living by the waterfront. I was very fortunate in as much that my parents really believed in schooling and education, as all of you are sitting here and demonstrating your commitment to this, I'm sure supported by your parents and by your friends. I was very fortunate that I uh, got to Cisco, and let me give you my journey. I was in Brooklyn, and I was going to uh, Polytech, and I was thinking, well, you know, I think I could stick this out. And then they torched the apartment across the street at 4 a.m. 
The flames were shooting off the roof of the apartment at 4 a.m. I looked at it, I went back upstairs as if my father knew what I was thinking. He said, you got a brother in California, you should go to California. I came to California, uh, Cisco was my third startup. I was incredibly fortunate. One of my early jobs at a startup is I was a technician that I used to do breadboarding for the developer. So he would give me the schematic, I would assemble the components, I would go down to Fry's Electronics when there was only one of them to get the components, he would write the software, we would test the circuit card, the circuit card would catch fire, we start again the next day, <laughs> you know, uh, with that. Uh, by the way, one other thing, we needed an oven to heat up all the circuit cards because of, finally we got the, the cards to work. And they said, well, we need an oven to burn them all in. Well, we didn't have an oven. And an oven back then to burn in circuit cards cost sixty dollars to $100,000. That was a lot of money, even back then in a startup. So I got tasked with trying to find an oven for a lot less than sixty dollars or $70,000. So I said, well, I need Jimmy to go with me. They said, why do you need Jimmy? I go, Jimmy's got a pickup truck. I took Jimmy to the junkyard. We found an oven. The guy said, it's $200. I said, look, we don't even know if it works. I'll give you $100 in cash, and we'll take the oven now. He said, OK. We took the oven. Thank God it was the real stat that had burnt out, and that was it. But that's how we got an oven for a grand total of $100 plus a real stat, which I think was another 20 bucks. Anyway, I started at Cisco as a tech technical support engineer. I took inbound customer calls, uh, helping them configure uh, and set up Cisco software, routing, switching, uh, terminal servers. And when I first started, there was eight people in my group. Today, I'm proud to tell you we have 5,500 people globally including about 500 plus in, uh, in San Jose who deliver world-class technical service for customers that use our data center products, our security products, collaboration, uh, video, et cetera. And we support all customers in all different segments, the public sector, enterprise, telcos, the, uh, the Web 2.0 companies as an example. Um, anyway, over here you can see a picture of me and my three other brothers. You can see a picture of me and my uh, parents. Um, as well. And you can actually see a, oh, by the way, this was a good lesson for me. This is when phones first started to have cameras. And I learned the lesson that if you put on a pair of sunglasses and put on a half for a, for a split second, somebody will take your photo. So there you have it. And by the way, that's me after 17 years uh, getting my college degree through the amazing support of my coworkers and my wife. Uh, it was quite a, um, uh, a journey. Also, a picture of, uh, obviously, I'm part of the community. Part of my obligation to the community is to give back. Uh, my wife and I are involved in a number of charitable organizations, as well as being involved in several schools as well. Because it's about creating the future for all of you, just like people did for me when I first got to California. OK, the beginning of Cisco. It was a husband and wife that were going to school at Stanford trying to solve an issue because the two different schools at Stanford cannot communicate with each other because they had used two different protocols. And back then, that was like two different languages. They were not going to speak to each other. And so they began to build the algorithm around routing the protocols, making them understand each other. And by the way, originally, Cisco was a play on San Francisco, which is why you see the bridge. It was a small C. And I've, I'll never forget, it was a big debate about making it a large C, because we had to change all the marketing material. So what are we about at Cisco? It's hard to believe now Cisco is coming on 30 years, but about helping the way people work, lie, live, play, and learn. Now it's from a world stage. And those things matter. You know, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a moment. But we have Cisco academies all over the world educating thousands of students. We have set up telemedicine in Jordan in the Middle East to permit high-class healthcare so people don't have to go seven, eight hours of bus rides to get to the main city to get the type of care that they need. To care, to need, they need, that they need. Our strategy is to build solutions and to drive outcomes for our customers that are out there around the world. We're a company that does about $50 billion a year. About $12 billion of that is in services. The rest is in all the different technologies that we sell around the world. The Internet of Everything, digitalization, it is changing life. 
If you look it up in Wikipedia, you can actually find the word digitalization. These words have been now defined uh, with that. But it's about really making a difference. Now, this is a very unique opportunity because typically in life, cities and states and countries typically are laggards when it comes to adopting technology. In this case, cities, states, and countries have become leaders because it affects the safety and security of their citizens, giving their citizens access to quality services, uh, helping them collect more revenue for parking. You know, one of the things about most major cities is 25% of the traffic is people are spinning around looking for a parking space. By the way, I felt like that a little bit this morning while I was in the garage on 10th Street, by the way. Uh, but anyway, um, so anyway, it's about, and digitalization is a way that a business tries to increase their revenue and drive more value through a set of processes that become digitized. What the hell does he mean when he says that? But let me give you an example. How many of you are familiar with Amazon Dash, the little Wi-Fi thing? Okay, it's great. Once you have it, you, you, know, you do the subscription, you press a button, all of a sudden your laundry soap shows up another, a month later, you never run out. You know, when I was younger, you bought newspapers by subscription, that was it. Now you can buy batteries, you can buy laundry soap. Again, it's a simple device. They sell it for five bucks. Of course, they lose money on doing that. What they want to do is get you as a repeat customer with longevity. That's an example. Um, uh, and the other example I gave you was certainly around telemedicine. Uh, another example is the work we've done with Harley Davidson. We will take new product introduction, which had been measured literally to the tune of one and a half years down to two weeks. And in the world of Harley Davidson and motorcycles, people's tastes change quickly. And to stay relevant, they could no longer afford a uh, product cycle of a year and a half. So where are you guys called Cisco? We are literally everywhere. Um, when you order something online, there's an excellent chance that online experience is powered by, um, by Cisco. Infotainment, one of the best things that we offer is service provider video. So as you use video, whether it's Netflix, from Verizon, and you stream it on your phone, all of that is powered by Cisco technology. And that's literally one of our business units called service provider um, uh, video, just to name a few. Certainly it's about security. You know, you gotta remember when the internet was born, no one ever thought about security. And of course now, a lot of people could get fired for a security um, hack, right? And the, and the bad guys have gotten incredibly smart, right? Viruses that get compiled at the other end through multiple sources, or they send you an email based upon your LinkedIn profile on something you're more likely to open up. So if you talk about that you're interested in sports, and particularly into uh, baseball, for example, somebody might try to ship you an email based upon your likes, trying to get you to open up that email and open up that attachment. They're getting very evil out there. Um, anyway, and it's about affecting people's life um, uh, from education uh, to public uh, services. Okay, so a couple of other things. The Rio Olympics, hundreds of thousands of hours of video streamed around the world without incident. Now, you've got to remember, in North America, you're thinking, well, that's not a big thing. But think about the people watching both, the sprinter, out of Jamaica, right? We were on call with Digicel, who provides the video streaming for the folks, because literally the whole country shut down when those events were going on. But to supply tens of thousands of hours of video around the world seamlessly, which was powered by uh, Cisco. We're certainly involved with uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, we certainly are heavily involved with uh, Microsoft, and again, uh, with many things around ESPN and things like that. By the way, interesting thing about video. Video drives an incredible amount of internet traffic, but also when it comes to sporting events, sporting events, the advertising money has been going through the roof. Why is that? That's because around the world, culturally, we want to watch sporting events live. You know, Sometimes people tape a sporting event, they may go back to it later, but in general, people want to watch sporting events live, and therefore you can see the amount of ad money going into sports absolutely going through the roof, which is completely changing that business model. 
So let's talk a little bit about Cisco, headquartered on Tasman uh, by Great America, um, uh, literally about uh, 15 or 20 minutes away. 71,000 regular employees, that does not count tens of thousands of contractors. 380 offices uh, around the world. Um, you could see here the breakdown. 35% uh, in engineering, a lot of the R&D is done in San Jose, California. Some of it is done in, in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Some of it is done in Bangalore, but the majority is done in San Jose. 20% in services from around the world. You could see in sales, 26%, and 19% uh, accounting and another. It really takes a team to pull these things together and to provide these outcomes and these solutions for our customers around the world um, about who we are and the competitive landscape. And by the way, the competitive landscape has certainly changed over time. We have niche competitors like um, Foundry and Extreme. Then we have major competitors such as Hewlett Packard, and on the service provider side, such as Alcatel out of Europe and Railway out of uh, China, uh, just to name a few of our competitors in the, um, uh, in the uh, marketplace. By the way, one thing I do want to mention, you know, I put up these numbers, but I should never forget that it's about our people. You know, at Cisco, I often talk about people, process, and technology. But people are the one who tells you what processes you need to get better, and people are the ones that tell you what technology you need, and people are the ones that actually make it happen. You know, sometimes we over-rotate about, you know, it's about the technology, it's about automation. Well, none of that matters without really sharp people who are passionate, who care, who are not afraid of failure, who want to be part of a team, right? Passionate, not afraid of failure, they want to be part of a team, and they want to get some things done, and they want to solve some problems. Now, let me talk about some of the job roles that are happening with, digital, with digitalization. So I'm going to point to a couple of these. On the cybersecurity, there's a million openings that are listed in North America. And by the way, when you have that many openings, there's probably another million behind it, because if you need 10, your boss typically does not let you open up 10 openings. Your boss typically goes, open up five, you get those filled, we'll open up the next five. Tremendous shortage in cybersecurity, which affects all industries. This is not unique to high tech. I mean, you could be into making you know, food, water, utilities, et cetera. This affects everybody. Certainly around uh, network programmer, SDN, software-defined networking. You know, that is how the data center is getting automated to take advantage of changing a business process. So it used to be in the data center to turn on applications, which are the lifeblood of your business, to create revenue or to improve the customer experience would take months. We live in a world now that people don't want to talk months. People want to talk hours and days. And through SDN, these applications can be turned on in literally days through the appliance that have been designed uh, by Cisco as well as a couple of other companies. Certainly a 3D print technician. You know, as 3D printing has become main stage, and I'll give you a great example. I had hip surgery five years ago. Uh, back then, the surgeon had to pick from a couple of different sizes. If that surgery was occurred today, they would literally take a measurement and then print out the hip on a 3D printer. And why is that beneficial? because then the surgeon has to do less cutting. If there's less cutting, you will recover quicker. Just to give you an example about how this is really changing the way things are, are, um, are happening. Uh, certainly implant technician with Nero. Uh, I'm sure we all have families, aunts, uncles, grandparents, that the size of the listening devices, that if they have a hearing impairment, are getting smaller and yet more powerful, giving them good quality of life. Because it is, you know, it is no fun when you have a, a family member or a grandparent who feel left out of the conversation because they can't hear. But this is really radically making a difference. And the batteries have gotten so much better. I remember the, I remember the hearing aids from years ago it used to be very large, used to be wore outside the ear, and the battery would literally last like a day or two. That was crazy. Now you got things with much more, um, uh, much more power, much more sensitivity, again, for good quality of life. Certainly a cloud architect. In the world of cloud and the world of hybrid cloud, which means a lot of companies are going to do some things in the cloud, some things they're going to do both within their enterprise and with the cloud, they're going to need architects to figure out the traffic, 
the queuing of this traffic, and, and how to really get that done. So anyway, I think what's important is a lot of times in the news, you'll hear about what jobs are going away. But typically, you do not hear in the news all the jobs that are getting created that are shorthanded. You typically don't hear that part of it, right? But this is why education is so important, and you've taken a critical step. By the way, in your life, you'll learn three ways. You'll learn through education. You'll learn through exposure. As you get out there, you'll learn because you're getting exposed to things. And you certainly will learn by experience. The one caveat I will tell you about experience is that you don't want to learn the same thing 20 years in a row. That every couple of years, you've got to think about reinventing your capabilities and your skills about who you are and what you're doing. Because if not, you, quickly, you then fall behind. The beauty is being an engineering student, you've created a foundation of learning that will last for you as you go forward in, in, um, in life. So let's talk about our networking academies at Cisco. How many of you guys knew we had a networking academies at Cisco around the world? Oh, I got one taker. Okay, good. At least I knew one person was paying attention. Good. <laughs> anyway, 193 academies all over the world, 35% uh, female, 84,000 students. We have really made a difference in people's lives about the, um, the network computer engineers of tomorrow. Uh, we work with um, uh, STEM partnerships with 3,000 youth getting trained, people with disability, high levels of employment, volunteering. We're very big about giving back. A lot of times you'll see us down at the food bank where we're um, getting food together. Let me tell you an amazing stat about the food bank. You know, it used to be that people went to the food bank for food because they were out of jobs. Now, a lot of people that go to the food bank, they work, they have jobs, but their jobs do not give them enough money to pay for their family's groceries. There was an example last year of a husband who worked, the wife was studying in nursing, they had two kids, and she was having to cut the milk. Literally, having to cut the milk. We live in such a rich area. That was you know, just an incredible story to hear from the food bank. About global hunger. Uh, I'm gonna give you a great example about this. In India, they figured out when they improved the quality and the volume of food at the school, attendance went through the roof. Why? Because kids were not eating enough at home. So the attendance went through the roof, but then they found that after lunch, many of the kids would leave. So what did they do? They had a snack for them, including food they could take home at the end of the school day to drive complete attendance. Talk about basic hunger and food, right? It's an amazing story. I got to meet that individual. It was an amazing story about how he made, uh, and he, by the way, he does this all over India. He started in one area, he does it across India now, pretty uh, uh, powerful thing. But it's about being part of the community. A lot of times we hear giving back and we think, okay, I gotta write a check. Sometimes the most important thing you can give is time and yourself, much more than actually the money aspect. So with your career, you know, don't be afraid to have people look at your resume to critique it. That's okay. The only way we get better is through feedback. You know, Michael Jordan was an incredible NBA basketball player. How many of you guys remember Michael Jordan? Okay, good. I got a handful. I remember one day he was practicing free throws. And he said, Michael, you won a number of championships. You're an R-star. You're an MVP. He said, I still need to get better. Those words never left me when I was watching that interview with him on the court. Mock interviews. You know, put yourself out there. Go through a mock interview. Don't do your first interview in front of a real company. Have some fun with it. You know, be prepared to answer questions about what do you enjoy to do. Give me an example of when you learn from failure, things like that. It's okay to put yourself out there. That's how we all learn. We all have gone through this. Remember, you're not alone. You are not alone. We've been through this. But do incorporate your friends. By the way, it's fun when people go, I need some help. Can you help me? People don't mind being asked. Info sessions for companies. Get to learn about the companies that you may be talking to. Certainly career fairs. Etiquette d d dinners. You know, there, you know, the reason why this is important is because managers are told to be passionate, to, that failure is okay, and to build strong teams. You want to make sure that you can be a member of a strong team and you can have an additive effect to the team if they were willing to take a chance on putting you on that team. Right? 
This is a quote from Albert Einstein. Scientists investigate that it already is. Engineers create that which has never been. That puts you in the driver's seat. Pretty exciting, yeah. Right? And staying connected with Cisco, five or six ways of how you can stay um, uh, connected uh, with Cisco. Um, I'll leave this uh, up on the board here uh, with this. So anyway, I wanted to spend the first part of this talking about Cisco, talking about our cultures, about our values, about who we are, hopefully making it exciting for yourself about things that you need to be thinking about, things that you should be doing. Obviously, you've made a commitment here today to spend time here today uh, listening to me speak. I know we've got a microphone and we've got a runner, and I'd love to hear some, a couple of you in the audience if uh, you'll um, be okay asking a question or two um, out there. And I got my brave runner right here. Ah, good, uh, uh, two brave runners. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, all right, we're ready to get on the scoreboard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pinjo. My name is Rohini. I'm sorry it was late, so that's why I'm standing here. That's okay. All right, so my question is basically, um, like following your career progression from being a business admin graduate from Golden Gate University and being at the, such a top position in a technical company. So what were those skills like, you know, from being like a business background and working all the time with technical? Sure. And considering from 1990 to now, the transformation in technology is so phenomenal. What were some things that you did? Sure. Or what you would like to give us as an input on Thank how you. we can cope with it? No, it's a great question. So the question is, what are some things you learned? What are some things you did from when you started to where you ended, you got to this position? So a couple of things. Um, you know, first, I quickly realized it was about people. That giving people respect, respecting domain expertise, treating people as equals was an incredible way of getting the best people to want to be on the teams I worked in, right? And it was about embracing people's cultures and backgrounds, whether it was different foods or different uh, holidays or whatever. I think I was very fortunate because my parents were very unique. My mother was incredibly kind. Anyone that came into the apartment, no matter who you were, you were gonna get food. She did not care your background, the color of your skin, your religion, you were going to get served. You were going to be made to feel comfortable. On the flip side, my father actually survived a prison camp and escaped in World War II. So people tell me I'm tough to have survived. I go, no, no. Tough are the people who are running to burning buildings. Tough are people like my father, right? And so I persevere. And the reason I use the word perseverance, a lot of times in the workplace, people shy away from difficult problems. My experience is difficult problems don't go away. They typically get worse. It's a bit risky to dive in, but I will tell you, the best way you can learn is to dive in into a difficult problem and to try to tackle it. So it's about people. It's about being kind and being respectful of people about whoever they are, building a team. And certainly, it's about perseverance. I think the last thing is about the willingness to take feedback. I was incredibly fortunate through the people that I worked with, uh, my wife at home, that people were not afraid to give me feedback. Uh, and sometimes taking feedback is not always easy. You know, sometimes I get a, I'll get a, a text message or an email from an engineer. And the engineer might be like a year or two out of school. And if their heart is in the right place, I tell them, I go, you could tell me whatever you need to tell me, right? But you know, how we get better is by listening, right? By being out there. Never think you know all the answers. I tell you, once somebody told me, a sign of someone who's smart is someone who clearly knows what they don't know. Think about that. Who clearly knows what they don't know. Right? Think about that. So, no, thank you. A great uh, uh, question. Uh, we're on a roll now. Who's ready to go next? Ah, I got a couple of hands right here. Thanks. We'll get you, and then we'll get you. Thanks. Now we're rolling. Hi, Mr. Pinto. My name is Ethan Clark. Um, hey. I was just curious, when, when a group of interns steps into your office, what do you look for when you're picking, say, one out of the 10 or 20? When a group of interns walk in, what am I looking for to pick one out of the 10 or 20? By the way, we do pick a few more than that. <laughs> well, you know, I'm looking for a willingness to learn, a curiosity. I'm also looking, I'm trying to feel out chemistry, because I do believe in the power of teams. 
So I'm looking for those three or four things, and I'm looking for um, um, uh, someone that's uh, prepared. That's a bit tricky. What do I mean by that? Someone that can ask a thoughtful question at the moment, showing that they may have spent a little bit of time prepping, right? Those are three or four um, unique uh, things. And I think lastly, be, be yourself, be authentic, be genuine, because we are who we are. But those are four or five things I would say. Great question, please. I was wondering if, uh, has Cisco ever been used for like uh, NASA or like space applications or uh, like for instance on board the space shuttles or the space station or, uh, well, or the satellites? So the, oh, Phil, Phil. Uh, Phil is here. Phil is a distinguished engineer who's I've had the privilege of working with for uh, 20 plus years. Uh, no, you'll find you. Cisco IP phones on the International Space Station. We've been involved with the uh, we had I think uh, Iris routers in space and the interplanetary. We've done some research work along the interplanetary internet. It turns out that when your delay starts to reach seconds and minutes, forget everything you learned about networking protocols on planet Earth. So, uh, but yeah, so we're, 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 we're involved in those things. Yeah, we do, have, we do have our products in space. By the way, it's a fitting time because yesterday was the 50-year anniversary of, uh, of uh, Star Trek. And uh, now, you, now, I know there's been a lot more newer Star Trek since then. How many of you are familiar with Star Trek? Okay, thank you. Don't make me nervous here. You were making me nervous. By the way, I'm going to confess to all of you. When I started, first started watching Star Trek, I thought it was pretty cool. Why did I think it was cool? Well, A, it was science fiction. It was these aliens, right? But also, I thought he's pretty cool that he was dating these women from different planets. <laughs> I mean, I thought I mean, I thought it was pretty cool. Anyway, okay, next question. Ah, thank you for being brave. Um, hi, I'm Zaki from Industrial Technology. Yes. And I'm also working on this project. Good. Like, uh, near working uh, router, router, router and switching. I was wondering, uh, how do I apply for an internship uh, during the summer? And I'm an international student from China. And the immigration has very strict rules about international student. And uh, my question is just, like, is there any opening and during the summer? For <laughs> I love it, I love it. Yeah. Uh, no, we do hire interns. It, it does vary by country, by function, and by group, as you would imagine, because different groups have different approaches. The R&D group uh, tend to do a lot in San Jose. In, in, um, in services, it's a bit of a combination of Raleigh, North Carolina, and San Jose. Uh, we do have facilities in China in both uh, uh, Beijing as well as, um, oh boy, Adalian, thank you, thank you, Phil, as well. Um, we typically do internships at our bigger sites. So Dalian is a bigger site. San Jose is a bigger site. Raleigh, North Carolina is a bigger site. Krakow, Poland. So we tend to do it in the, in the bigger sites. And, that, um, and, and so go to the website and also work through the university because we do a fair number of interns for obvious reasons because of the fact that, um, you know, high tech tends to be better at interning than a lot of other industries because that's how high tech got built was through you know using interns and then you kind of get a lot of your folks from the uh, pool of uh, interns. Phil, anything to add there? Interns. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, yeah. Uh, for for individual situations, your best bet is going through the through the website and the careers information. Um, again, I know there's complications with international assignments and things along those lines. Uh, the details vary quite a bit. Uh, so your your best bet is to you know reach out through some of these links that you got up there. Yeah, with that. Good question, though. Okay. And to Good. add to that, from the university's point of view, we, we are a CPT sponsor, so we do sponsor F1 students through curricular practical training. So I would encourage you to talk to the International Student Advising Center. They are in Clark Hall, and they can help you with any paperwork for industry um, sponsorships that are interested in internships. Good. You know, good, good, good. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so now that we're all friends, oh, I see a hand. We'll get the microphone out to you. Um, how's the company culture over at Cisco? Company culture, great question. You know, there's going to be two critical decisions you're going to make in life. You may have already made one. Who your, who your spouse is is a critical decision because that is a person that can really help support you gain to go to uh, beyond your own expectations. 
The company culture, that's another important aspect. Because wherever you work, you want to work in a culture that is nursing, that is forgiving of failure, that is there for you. And what I mean there for you, not so much when things go well, when things don't go well, right? We have done amazing things. So the company culture at Cisco is based upon four or five factors. First, it's based upon the employee. Because without the employee, nothing else matters, right? It's, all, it's also about that the DNA of the, that the customer's DNA has to be in everyone. Everyone's got to be thinking about the customer, right? Then it's about teamwork, right? It's about teamwork, right? And it's about a culture of, of, of supporting each other. But the reason I go back to supporting you when things go wrong, we have done, a, I'll, I'll give you an amazing story. We had an employee whose uh, child uh, suffered from a very difficult disease in a place where they didn't have good children's hospitals. We moved them and their wife and the child to the children's hospital in London, right? We just moved heaven and earth. Another good example is that about five plus years ago, there was these tremendous tidal waves in Japan, knocked out 600 central offices at NTT. Within four months, they got those central offices back online. They said, even including the local Japanese partners, no one partnered better than you, Cisco, to help us, right? But it's about the individual. It's about being there. One last story. I had an employee go from London to Sydney. They went to Sydney. They, they figured out they had a, a blood clot in their chest, potentially life-threatening. So I called them, and I, the first four things I offered them, the manager had already offered. I said, can I fly your wife and children out to be with you? My manager offered me that. When you go home, can we fly you back home with a doctor? My manager offered me that. By the time I get to the fourth thing, I go, you know, I'm not providing a lot of value here. You obviously have a great manager, you know, but that's what we want from our managers, to really be there for our people. Then when things are good, you certainly expect recognition, rewards, raises. One of the good things about Cisco is we have two budgets, one employee welfare, where we'll do things like food or even rent a movie house. And then we have connected recognitions where anyone could give anyone an award ranging from $100 to several thousand dollars just based upon someone going beyond the call of duty. And that person necessarily need not be in your group. That could be like if you're a, a tech engineer working with a systems engineer, working with a developer, that the systems engineer goes out to visit the customer at night, you're empowered to give that systems engineer an award thanking them for giving up their evening to go out to that customer, right? So it's also about a, a, a culture of environment as well. Does that make sense? Good, good. Yeah, one more quick, 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 please. Follow on to this, and then we'll get to you. Um, are you guys doing anything in your work environment to nurture creativity? To nurture creativity. We, we do. I think that, um, you know, it's all about innovation. And this is why, the reason why you hear so much about innovation, when I grew up in high tech, if you build a piece of software, if you build a platform, the shelf life on that was seven to ten years. Those are really good days. That was yesterday. Now, the shelf life is literally months. So you got to absolutely have a culture of innovation. So we do. We have, we have different events. We have hackathons. We have different ways of rewarding people. When people get patents, we have a way of rewarding them. Every person in service that gets a patent, I personally call them, thanking them, uh, because I think it's uh, very unique. And we, so we do it through different ways that we encourage people to go out there, uh, to go, uh, like as an example, we have an incredible program that when people go out to get additional training, we pay for it with tax-free dollars. So if you want to go get some certifications from even a competitor, we'll pay. If you want to go get some advanced learning and engineering, we'll pay. So we, we do about seven or eight things really well that we force to that because we, we, we're, we're respectful of the fact of the need of the individual to constantly raise their game. So we do it too. And, and everybody's a little bit different how they like to do it. Some people like to participate at events. Some people like to go get a, a, a couple more security certifications in addition to the ones they have. Uh, everyone learns at different paces. And also, we're very respectful of, um, of you know, I think the, uh, the need for a rich set of benefits to support people in their en endeavors, too, as well. Uh, you had a question. By the way, I haven't had any coffee yet this morning, so if I'm a little low on my energy, forgive me. Uh, good afternoon. Okay. Uh, my question is, what is, what was one of the biggest challenges that Cisco faced as a startup, and what advice can you give to startups nowadays? 
the biggest, advice, the biggest challenge as a startup was trying to do things at any sense of scale. Because when you're a startup, you know your customers, you know your people. And as things begin to go from 100 million to 250 to 500, all of a sudden, it puts a lot of pressure on who you're hiring. It puts a lot of pressure on your processes. And do you have the right people to, to do scale? And it's tricky because typically you go out and hire people to do scale that you probably would not have hired at the start of the company. Because the start of the company, you just want gorillas, barbarians. People are going to just make it happen no matter what. They're not even worrying about how to sell the customer number two. But they know how to sell the customer number one, right? But then you need a different skill set of people that can do things at scale, at globally. Which is the number one thing I would say is about the hiring mechanism. Because if you don't have that right, then you hire the wrong type of people that don't share your culture or your values, right? From a Cisco perspective, uh, uh, your question was one of the biggest challenges that we face. I know this like it happened yesterday. Years back, um, this is about 20 years ago, there was a problem on Ethernet lines with excessive collisions. So if you had an Ethernet card from Cisco or 3Com or Sun off the workstation, uh, it would cause the Internet link to be incredibly slow. But back then, remember, Ethernet was kind of fast at the time because you had serial lines of 9.6 speed, 19.2. Hell, I remember there were, there were 4,800, yikes, 2,400. So we took a decision as a company, which was very painful, that we re replaced every Ethernet card we had shipped. That was painful. We were a small company. We weren't sure if that was going to work. But to our shock, everybody else in the industry said that they wouldn't do that. Well, that turned out to be an incredibly bonus for us because we got a lot of kudos from our customers that we were willing to do the right thing. Because we're all going to be faced with a moment in time with a startup about doing the right thing. And when that happens, you know, you got to really think about what's the right thing for the customer and for us as employees. And when people start talking about, well, this wouldn't look good, that's a bit of a red flag. When people start saying, well, that wouldn't look good, or, you know, or when people start distorting the truth, that's another red flag. That's when you got to say, time out. This is about being direct. And sometimes to be direct and straight with the market hurts in the beginning, but then you get the credit on the back end. Does that make sense? I'll, I'll take one or two more. Don't forget, we got some goodies at the end. Right here, I got a hand. Okay. And then do it. Okay, go. All right, I got, I got two questions here. Okay. Uh, one, uh, how would you get that oven to work? And uh, uh, two, if you were to go back to school now, what would you study? Okay, what was the first question? How would you get that junkyard oven to work? The junkyard? Oh, the oven. Oh, the oven in the junkyard. How do you get the oven in the junkyard to work? Well, we were really lucky. It was just the real staff because we measured it, we shorted it. We went to the hardware store. Not knowing they were rated, I'm, I'm lucky I didn't burn down the building because I wasn't a licensed electrician. I was a technician. I got shorted. I went to the hardware store. I need one. I went back. I plugged it in. And one, uh, about a year later, someone said, it's good it didn't, burn, it didn't burn up. I go, why? He goes, well, those are rated. Did you buy the proper one for the oven? Yikes. You know, uh, with that. What would I study now? Boy, I got to tell you, man, my head spins on that question because I think it would be a combination of, 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 of something to do with technology, with business, with people. All these things are coming together at once. Um, the reason I mention about people, I think one of the critical things of how far you'll go is how well you interact, communicate, and deal with people, right? And if you get it right, it's a real joy. One tip I would have, when I talk to my technical support engineers, I use a phrase, remember the 99. And they go, what's that? I go, remember the 99 customers who say thank you. Ignore the one that gave you a tough time because they're probably having a tough day. And pro they're probably a good person, but remember the 99. In life, how often did you have a great day? And then when you get home, because someone cuts you off, you get home and you're, Arr! don't let that person that cuts you off screw up your day. Right? Remember the 99, you know, with that. So um, uh, anyway, good question. Thank you. Thank you. Do I got one more take you here? Okay. We won't, okay. So we've got some uh, giveaways for you on the way out. We've got, uh, as you're streaming your video, we've got these wonderful phone stands, and we've got some uh, 3D technology, uh, too, with the phones as well. So thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.